Chapter Two of the Agony Column. This LibriVox recording is in the public domain. Recording by Peak. The Agony Column by Earl Der Biggers. Chapter Two. The next day was Sunday, hence it brought no mail. Slowly it dragged along. At a ridiculously early hour Monday morning, Geoffrey West was on the street seeking his favorite newspaper. He found it, found the agony column, and nothing else. Tuesday morning, again he rose early, still hopeful. Then and there hope died. The lady of the Carlton deigned no reply. Well, he had lost, he told himself. He had staked all on this one bold throw. No use. Probably if she thought of him at all, it was to label him a cheap joker, a mountebank of the halfpenny press. Richly he deserved her scorn. On Wednesday he slept late. He was in no haste to look into the daily mail. His disappointments of the previous days had been too keen. At last, while he was shaving, he summoned Walters, the caretaker of the building, and sent him out to procure a certain morning paper. Walters came back bearing a rich treasure, for in the agony column of that day, West, his face white with lather, read joyously, Strawberry Man. Only the grapefruit lady's kind heart and her great fondness for mystery and romance move her to answer. The strawberry mad one may write one letter a day for seven days to prove that he is an interesting person, worth knowing. Then we shall see. Address M.A.L. Care Sadie Haight, Carlton Hotel. All day West walked on air, but with the evening came the problem of those letters on which depended, he felt, his entire future happiness. Returning from dinner, he sat down at his desk near the windows that looked out on his wonderful courtyard. The weather was still torrid, but with the night had come a breeze to fan the hot cheek of London. It gently stirred his curtains, rustled the papers on his desk. He considered. Should he at once make known the eminently respectable person he was, the hopelessly respectable people he knew? Hardly, for then on an instant like a bubble bursting would go for good all mystery and romance, and the lady of the grapefruit would lose interest and listen to him no more. He spoke solemnly to his rustling curtains. No, he said, we must have mystery and romance. But where, where shall we find them? On the floor above he heard the solid tramp of military boots belonging to his neighbor, Captain Stephen Fraser Freer of the 12th Cavalry Indian Army, home on furlough from that colony beyond the seas. It was from that room overhead that romance and mystery were to come in mighty store, but Geoffrey West little suspected it at the moment. Hardly knowing what to say, but gaining inspiration as he went along, he wrote the first of seven letters to the lady at the Carlton and the epistle he dropped in the post-box at midnight follows here. Dear Lady of the Grapefruit, you are very kind, also you are wise. Wise, because into my clumsy little personal you read nothing that was not there. You knew it immediately for what it was, the timid, tentative clutch of a shy man at the skirts of romance in passing. Believe me, old conservatism was with me when I wrote that message. He was fighting hard. He followed me, struggling, shrieking, protesting to the post-box itself. But I whipped him. Glory be, I did for him. We are young but once, I told him. After that, what use to signal to romance? The lady, at least, I said, will understand. He sneered at that. He shook his silly gray head. I will admit he had me worried. But now you have justified my faith in you. Thank you a million times for that. Three weeks I have been in this huge, ungainly, indifferent city longing for the States. Three weeks the agony column has been my sole diversion. And then, through the doorway of the Carlton restaurant, you came. It is of myself I must write, I know. I will not then tell you what is in my mind, the picture of you I carry. It would mean little to you. Many Texan gallants, no doubt, have told you the same while the moon was bright above you and the breeze was softly whispering through the branches of... The branches of the... of the... Confound it! I don't know. I have never been in Texas. It is a vice in me I hope soon to correct. All day I intended to look up Texas in the encyclopedia, but all day I have dwelt in the clouds, and there are no reference books in the clouds. Now I am down to earth in my quiet study. Pens, ink, and paper are before me. I must prove myself a person worth knowing. From his rooms, they say, you can tell much about a man. But alas, these peaceful rooms in Adelphi Terrace, I shall not tell the number, were sublet furnished. So if you could see me now, you would be judging me by the possessions left behind by one Anthony Bartholomew. 
There is much dust on them. Judge neither Anthony nor me by that. Judge, rather, Walters, the caretaker who lives in the basement with his gray-haired wife. Walters was a gardener once, and his whole life is wrapped up in the courtyard on which my balcony looks down. There he spends his time while up above the dust gathers in the corners. Does this picture distress you, my lady? You should see the courtyard. You would not blame Walters then. It is a sample of paradise left at our door, that courtyard. As English as a hedge, as neat, as beautiful. London is a roar somewhere beyond. Between our court and the great city is a magic gate forever closed. It was the court that led me to take these rooms. And since you are one who loves mystery, I am going to relate to you the odd chain of circumstances that brought me here. For the first link in that chain, we must go back to Interlaken. Have you been there yet? A quiet little town, lying beautiful between two shimmering lakes, with the great Jungfrau itself for scenery. From the dining room of one lucky hotel, you may look up at dinner and watch the old rose afterglow light the snow-capped mountain. You would not then say of strawberries, I hate them, or of anything else in all the world. A month ago I was in Interlaken. One evening, after dinner, I strolled along the main street, where all the hotels and shops are drawn up at attention before the lovely mountain. In front of one of the shops I saw a collection of walking sticks, and, since I needed one for climbing, I paused to look them over. I had been at this only a moment when a young Englishman stepped up and also began examining the sticks. I had made a selection from the lot and was turning away to find the shopkeeper when the Englishman spoke. He was lean, distinguished-looking, though quite young, and had that well-tubbed appearance that I am convinced is the great factor that has enabled the English to assert their authority over colonies like Egypt and India, where men are not so thoroughly bathed. Uh, if you'll pardon me, old chap, he said, not that stick, if you don't mind my saying so. It's not tough enough for mountain work. I would suggest... To say that I was astonished is putting it mildly. If you know the English at all, you know it is not their habit to address strangers, even under the most pressing circumstances. Yet here was one of that haughty race actually interfering in my selection of a stick. I ended by buying the one he preferred, and he strolled along with me in the direction of my hotel, chatting meantime in a fashion far from British. We stopped at the Kursaal, where we listened to the music, had a drink, and threw away a few francs on the little horses. He came with me to the veranda of my hotel. I was surprised, when he took his leave, to find that he regarded me in the light of an old friend. He said he would call on me the next morning. I made up my mind that Archibald Enright, for that, he told me, was his name, was an adventurer down on his luck, who chose to forget his British exclusiveness under the stern necessity of getting money somehow, somewhere. The next day, I decided, I should be the victim of a touch. But my prediction failed. Enright seemed to have plenty of money. On that first evening I had mentioned to him that I expected shortly to be in London, and he often referred to that fact. As my time approached for me to leave Interlaken, he began to throw out the suggestion that he should like to have me meet some of his people in England. This also was unheard of, against all precedent. Nevertheless, when I said good-bye to him, he pressed into my hand a letter of introduction to his cousin, Captain Stephen Fraser Freer of the 12th Cavalry, Indian Army, who, he said, would be glad to make me at home in London, where he was on furlough at the time, or would be when I reached there. Stephen's a good sort, said Enright. He'll be jolly pleased to show you the ropes. Give him my best, old boy. Of course I took the letter, but I puzzled greatly over the affair. What could be the meaning of this sudden warm attachment that Archie had formed for me? Why should he want to pass me along to his cousin at a time when that gentleman, back home after two years in India, would be, no doubt, extremely busy. I made up my mind I would not present the letter, despite the fact that Archie had, with great persistence, wrung from me a promise to do so. I had met many English gentlemen, and I felt they were not the sort, despite the example of Archie, to take a wandering American to their bosoms when he came with a mere letter. By easy stages I came to London. Here I met a friend, just sailing for home, who told me of some sad experiences he had had with letters of introduction, of the cold, fishy, my dear fellow, why trouble me with it, stares that had greeted their presentation. Good-hearted men all, he said, but averse to strangers, an ever-present trait in the English, always excepting Archie. So I put the letter to Captain Fraser Freer out of my mind. I had business acquaintances here, and a few English friends, and I found these, as always, courteous and charming. But it is to my advantage to meet as many people as may be, 
and after drifting about for a week i set out one afternoon to call on my captain i told myself that here was an englishman who had perhaps thawed a bit in the great oven of india if not no harm would be done it was then that i came for the first time to this house on adelphi terrace for it was the address archie had given me walters let me in and i learned from him that captain fraser freer had not yet arrived from india his rooms were ready he had kept them during his absence as seems to be the custom over here and he was expected soon perhaps said walters his wife remembered the date he left me in the lower hall while he went to ask her waiting i strolled to the rear of the hall and then through an open window that let in the summer i saw for the first time that courtyard which is my great love in london the old ivy-covered walls of brick the neat paths between the blooming beds the rustic seat the magic gate it was incredible that just outside lay the world's biggest city with all its poverty and wealth its sorrows and joys its roar and rattle here was a garden for jane austen to people with fine ladies and courtly gentlemen here was a garden to dream in to adore and to cherish when walters came back to tell me that his wife was uncertain as to the exact date when the captain would return i began to rave about that courtyard at once he was my friend i had been looking for quiet lodgings away from the hotel and i was delighted to find that on the second floor directly under the captain's rooms there was a suite to be sublet walters gave me the address of the agents and after submitting to an examination that could not have been more severe if i had asked for the hand of the senior partner's daughter they let me come here to live the garden was mine and the captain three days after i arrived i heard above me for the first time the tread of his military boots now again my courage began to fail i should have preferred to leave archie's letter lying in my desk and know my neighbor only by his tread above me i felt that perhaps i had been presumptuous in coming to live in the same house with him but i had represented myself to walters as an acquaintance of the captain's and the caretaker had lost no time in telling me that my friend was safely home so one night a week ago i got up my nerve and went to the captain's rooms i knocked he called to me to enter and i stood in his study facing him he was a tall handsome man fair-haired mustached the very figure that you my lady in your boarding-school days would have wished him to be his manner i am bound to admit was not cordial captain i began i'm very sorry to intrude it wasn't the thing to say of course but i was fussed however i happen to be a neighbor of yours and i have here a letter of introduction from your cousin archibald enright i met him in interlaken and we became very good friends indeed said the captain he held out his hand for the letter as though it were evidence at a court-martial i passed it over wishing i hadn't come he read it through it was a long letter considering its nature while i waited standing by his desk he hadn't asked me to sit down i looked about the room it was much like my own study only i think a little dustier being on the third floor it was further away from the garden consequently walters reached there seldom the captain turned back and began to read the letter again this was decidedly embarrassing glancing down i happened to see on his desk an odd knife which i fancy he had brought from india the blade was of steel dangerously sharp the hilt of gold carved to represent some heathen figure then the captain looked up from archie's letter and his cold gaze fell full upon me my dear fellow he said to the best of my knowledge i have no cousin named archibald enright a pleasant situation you must admit it's bad enough when you come to them with a letter from their mother but here i was in this englishman's rooms boldly flaunting in his face a warm note of commendation from a cousin who did not exist i owe you an apology i said i tried to be as haughty as he and fell short by about two miles i brought the letter in good faith no doubt of that he answered evidently it was given me by some adventurer for purposes of his own i went on though i am at a loss to guess what they could have been i'm frightfully sorry really said he but he said it with the london inflection which plainly implies i'm nothing of the sort a painful pause i felt that he ought to give me back the letter but he made no move to do so and of course i didn't ask for it uh, good night said i and hurried toward the door good night he answered and i left him standing there with archie's accursed letter in his hand that is the story of how i came to this house in adelphi terrace there is mystery in it you must admit my lady once or twice since that uncomfortable call i have passed the captain on the stairs but the halls are very dark and for that i am grateful 
I hear him often above me. In fact, I hear him as I write this. Who was Archie? What was the idea, I wonder? Ah, oh, well, I have my garden, and for that I am indebted to Archie the garrulous. It is nearly midnight now. The roar of London has died away to a fretful murmur, and somehow across this baking town a breeze has found its way. It whispers over the green grass, in the ivy that climbs my walls, in the soft murky folds of my curtains. Whispers what? Whispers perhaps the dreams that go with this, the first of my letters to you. They are dreams that even I dare not whisper yet. And so, good night, the Strawberry Man. End of chapter 2